All right, I think we're going to get started. Oh, so welcome to our session on ensuring a fair chance for all after transplant and opportunities to improve post transplant care. Um, as you enter, you can type your name into the chat and put in your connection to transplant. We, some of the people that already entered have done that. Um, and let's see. You can see the Q&A down at the bottom as well. You can write in your questions. Um, my name is Kathleen Anderson, and I have an eight-year-old daughter who had a heart transplant when she was almost two. So it's, um, it's been almost seven years. Um, and I am honored to welcome today Dr. Sharad Wadwani. He is a pediatric gastroenterologist and liver specialist caring for children with GI diseases and undergoing liver transplant at UCSF. And his research focuses on understanding social diversity impacts and care after transplant. And I would, so I will let you go ahead and take it away. Talk thank you so much. And thank you uh, to everyone here. Um, it's it's really an honor to be here and, and to, to speak with you all virtually. Um, as Kathleen said, I uh, am an assistant professor of pediatrics at uh, the University of California, San Francisco. Um, I have no conflicts. So I wanted to start by really um, sharing how I sort of got uh, started on this research path to really understand how social determinants of health impact outcomes for children after liver transplant and how we as transplant teams can, can adapt the way that we provide care to improve outcomes for our kids um, uh, after transplant. So when I was in GI fellowship, um, we had a, a I saw a two-year-old boy who had gotten a liver transplant six months prior to when I first met him. And the, the family lived about five hours from the transplant center in another state. And the child had had an intermittent cough for about 12 weeks and saw his, his general pediatrician who started him on asthma medications, albuterol and budesonide. Um, but the cough never really got better. And then four weeks prior to when I met him, he started having diarrhea and then developed an intermittent limp um, for about two weeks prior to when I saw him. And um, then he was transferred to us urgently after going to the local hospital with respiratory distress uh, and when we saw him and did a CT scan of his chest, we found, unfortunately, that he had B-cell cancer uh, from EBV um, viremia, which is a, a known yet somewhat preventable complication after transplant. And so I started wondering, how could this happened. The family had gone to the general pediatrician several times over the past three months. They had called the transplant center and, and yet this child ended up having this unfortunate complication from their transplant. And I specifically became curious about how our environment and our neighborhood resources and how the health system current structure really allowed this unfortunate complication to happen. So some of the questions that started to go through my head was um, what local resources were available? How busy was that pediatrician? How familiar were they with transplant patients? What kind of access did the family have to primary care? And how easy was it from the family's perspective to get in touch with their transplant team? Ultimately, what I was really feeling and wanting to figure out is how we can prevent this from happening again in the future. So 
We, you may have heard a lot about the social determinants of health, um, and I think it's really helpful to really define what I mean by that. So the WHO or the World Health Organization defines the social determinants of health as the non-medical factors that influence health outcomes. They are the conditions in which people are born, grow, work, live, and age, and the wider sets of forces and systems shaping the conditions of daily life. Francis Collins, the, the former director of the NIH, has said that if the DNA is our biological blueprint, the ZNA, or our zip code at birth, is the blueprint for our behavioral and psychosocial makeup. And to really put that into context, here on the screen is the map of New York City. And you can see that East Harlem and Murray Hill both in Manhattan and separated by only six subway stops, have a nine, people born in those different neighborhoods have a nine year difference in expected life expectancy. Really driving home that, that neighborhood context and the local resources available to us are really important for our health. So how can we study this? Well, the American Community Survey is put out by the US Census Bureau every five years. And so census workers go out into various communities and do in-depth surveys with a sampling of residents. And all of this information is publicly available and we can use this ACSD data to really study health disparities. And the way that we can do that is we can take addresses and convert them to latitude and longitude coordinates. And from there, we can identify which census tract the child lives in. Census tracts are um, drawn by the US Census Bureau and they're intended to capture a re relatively homogenous group of individuals or a sort of a neighborhood of individuals. And from there, we can extract various area-based measures. For example, we can get percent of the population below the federal poverty line or percentage of households that are vacant or the median household income of a neighborhood. And so one tool that we've been using is something called the deprivation index. And this is a composite index of these six variables. And what it's really intended to do is capture socioeconomic deprivation. Pragmatically, the tool that we use, the score ranges from zero to one and um, values closer to one indicate neighborhoods with more socioeconomic deprivation. To, to show you in visual format what the deprivation index looks like, zoomed in here is the city of Cincinnati where the index was developed. And what you can see here is that even within this, uh, within a city, there's a wide range of deprivation indices, which really suggests that this captures a neighborhood level measure of socioeconomic status. And when we've used this index, what we found is that children um, from more deprived neighborhoods have higher rates of poor medication adherence to tacrolimus um, with about almost double the children in the most deprived quartile neighborhoods having poor adherence compared to the, the rest of the co cohort in our sample that we used. And when we looked at all children after transplant, we found that children who live in higher deprivation neighborhoods have an increased risk of having an episode of graft failure requiring a retransplantation and an increased risk of death. So we started to ask ourselves, how can we address these disparities? And in 2019, the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, um, also known as NASM, put out a report called Integrating Social Care into the Delivery of Healthcare. 
And, and so these reports are, are very high level and they are really intended to enable policymakers and health system leaders to kind of know the direction that we need to move the healthcare system into. And in this report, they talked about five activities that healthcare systems can undertake. Uh, and they call this the five A's framework. Awareness refers to health systems intentionally becoming aware of patients and their families, household social risk factors. Um, and then these activities here, adjustment and assistance refer to activities that healthcare teams can, can do to help serve individuals. So adjustment means adjusting the type of care you provide. Um, for example, if someone has transportation difficulties, converting their appointment to virtual rather than in person. And assistance refers to providing assistance for identified needs. So if a family has transportation problems, assistance means giving a, a taxi voucher to the family to come to their appointment. So those are focused on the individuals and then the alignment and advocacy, which I won't talk as much about, refers to uh, alignment refers to sort of identifying the needs of the surrounding communities that you serve and investing in them. And then advocacy refers to, you know, going to the Hill and advocating for new policies and laws. But what I wanted to share a little bit about is our ongoing study called um, Social and Contextual Impact on Children Undergoing Liver Transplantation, or Social TX. And so this is a collaborative study across um, nine different transplant centers in the United States. And you can see the investigators from each of the centers on the screen. Um, but we have wide representation from across the US. And the overarching goal of Social TX is to identify strategies for the health system to intervene on social adversity for children undergoing liver transplant. Oops. Uh, so briefly, it's sort of a two-pronged study. We're enrolling patients at the time of transplant and we're trying to, we're administering a survey to capture a variety of social risks. And then we're also spending time talking with caregivers, and maybe um, some of you might have participated in our study, uh, but we sit and we, we interview caregivers for about an hour, and we ask them all sorts of questions about their household, um, what it's like getting going to their transplant center, and what barriers they have. And the goal of that is to really try to learn how we can improve transplant care. So I'll share a little bit of the data from our qualitative interviews here um, and where we really tried to characterize the needs of transplant families. And so, as I mentioned, we did a one hour interview with um, a, hand, a, a number of, of families. These were all conducted via Zoom. They were semi-structured, which means that we had an interview guide, but based on what a family was saying, we could then ask follow-up questions or steer the conversation in the direction that the family was sort of wanting to go in. And we, we aim to uh, recruit about 20, 20 families. Uh, and this was what we call an iterative study design. So after we interview a couple people and learn, learn from their experiences, we can then adapt the interview guide and ask new questions to subsequent um, participants. When you do qualitative research, you uh, you generate about you know thousands of pages of text, right? Because we record each interview and then we professionally transcribe the interviews, and then we have these that you know pages and pages of rich text that families have told us. And, and so what we do is we do some qualitative coding where we look at line by line, everything that families tell us, and we code that into different buckets. 
And these buckets are, well, the, the model that we used is something called the Comb B model, where we really try to break down barriers into capability, motivation, or opportunity barriers to really help us understand how we can intervene. So an example of a capability barrier would be if a, if a caregiver told us that they, they didn't know how to um, keep track of the medication. They didn't have a, a book or a whiteboard, you know, that would be a capability barrier. A motivation barrier would be a parent feels uncomfortable talking about challenges they're having with the liver team because they feel like it's not really the liver team's job. So it, that, that's a motivation uh, challenge. They know how to talk about a social need or risk, but they, they don't feel like it's an appropriate thing to do. And then an opportunity challenge barrier would be just being unaware of resources available to help with social risks. Okay, so we recruited, um, in our first study, we recruited about 18, we recruited 18 patients uh, from our transplant center, UCSF. And about half of the patients had um, some college or, or less in terms of education. 10% um, lived below the, the federal poverty line. And about half of the participants we were able to recruit had some evidence of financial strain. And the themes that we identified could really be bucketed into sort of patient household themes and health system themes. <clears throat> so the first theme that we identified was around transplant task management. It was really clear that every caregiver we spoke to had an intricate system for managing tacrolimus and, and the immunosuppression. As soon as we asked caregivers how they managed their immunosuppression, every caregiver gave us a really in-depth uh, summary of how they manage their, their immunosuppression. So this caregiver said, even when he goes to his grandparents' house, I pack his bag with it. I tell my husband, don't ever pack it, don't ever give it to him because I'm doing it and that's how it's always been. That concept, remembering new doses is really easy, but it's not at the same time. When it came to, to managing blood work, some caregivers really relied on the transplant team to let them know that, they, that their child was due for blood, whereas others uh, had their own system for managing that. So one parent said, blood work, I just usually wait for them to call me and say, hey, he's due, and then I take him. Another um, caregiver said, I have a calendar on my phone and I just put everything on there. And then I always take him to the lab on a Friday because that's my day off. We kind of have our routine already. The second theme that emerged was that the indirect costs of seeking care are very high. Um, so one caregiver said, the other stressful thing I think is just when she's in the hospital, trying to make sure that not only your child is taken care of and eating correctly, but making sure that the family members are taking care of themselves. It does get expensive. I do know we spent probably over $500 in parking fees during her transplant time. Another caregiver said, we spent thousands of dollars on parking because we were there every day for hours. We would max out every day. The third theme that emerged was around employer considerations. Um, some employers were extremely understanding of the need for last minute uh, um, work uh, cancellations, et cetera, whereas other employers were not really um, as uh, accommodating to caregivers. So, so one caregiver talked about 
how I'm ve- I was very grateful to have a company that rallied together and employees donated paid time off for the entire three months that I was gone. Whereas another caregiver said, I'm like, I'm sorry, I have to drop what I'm doing. This is also meaning I could lose my job, but my kid comes first. If they get tired of it for whatever reason, I'll get another job, but my kid needs to be fine for me to be fine. Just getting my shift covered, it's stressful sometimes. You have to be literally texting everybody, can you cover? The fourth theme was around appointments and how easy or hard it was to schedule appointments. And everyone talked about how easy it was to get appointments with their transplant team. Whereas um, they all sort of bemoaned the other departments within the hospital um, and how much harder it was to get appointments that fit within their schedule. So one caregiver said, whenever she has to miss school, we preemptively try and schedule it during a break time. For instance, she's gonna be admitted in April for a wedge pressure liver biopsy. So we did that over spring break. Another caregiver said he did an ultrasound. It's always like, okay, let us get back to you. And when would that be? When would the ultrasound clinic be available? So we don't really have that much of a flexibility or choice. We know he needs it, but we are at the mercy of whatever schedule works. And then the fifth theme that emerged was around responsibility. Caregivers really felt like some tasks were their responsibility and not the the responsibility of the transplant team. So one caregiver said, but by now they've made enough mistakes to where they've kind of gotten it down a little bit, but it's still every time I order, I have to. And then she listed out the steps for ordering compounded tacrolimus and then said, you guys really have nothing to do with it. So I'm like, I'm just going to deal with it because I know what the problem is so I can fix it. Another caregiver talked about how she had to find community-based resources outside of the transplant team, stating, I did not find any of these resources from the team. I didn't find out about in-home health services through the team. They didn't talk about CCS. I had to find out all of this myself because his first chunk of meds I had to pay for out of pocket. It was $300 as I was leaving the hospital. So as we think about these themes, there's patient and household themes and health system themes. And what was really clear to us is that caregivers are extremely capable of managing their child's transplant needs. and they're highly motivated to do so as well. But there is an opportunity barrier. The increased hassle of having to navigate complex multiple pharmacies, uh, getting compounded tacrolimus, and um, making blood work appointments, getting clinic appointments and ultrasound appointments creates a lot of added um struggle for for caregivers, and I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir a little bit here, I realize. Um, But when we think about the health system and how um, we could better support you all, it, it feels like we have the ability, so we have the opportunity. We are very motivated, especially um, the the transplant teams are, are are clearly very motivated. But we do have capability barriers um, in in terms of our ability to robustly detect and help uh, patients and families with additional hardships. We have room to improve in our our capability. So I think, you know, as we think about how we put this all together, I think what we our next phase is really to start to talk to different transplant teams and learn about how structures influence their ability to to care for diverse patients. And I think all of this will enable health system change. So I wanna briefly talk about what those interventions might look like. When I think for transplant work, we have patients coming from all over geographically, I think focusing on the adjustment and assistant pieces will be the most high yield. 
And so one thing that we are now piloting at UCSF um, is something called a health advocate. So health advocates or patient navigators have been used in various uh, fields. Um, uh, and, and sometimes they can be called community health workers, but these tend to be lay health workers. They don't have advanced master's degrees or doctoral degrees or social work degrees. Um, and what they can really help patients and transplant teams do is they can really be a liaison between families and transplant teams where they can really spend a lot of time learning about the various needs um, that, that families are having. And then they can help the, the families address those needs by finding community-based resources, or they can also find, um, they can also go to the transplant team and help them uh, as well. Um, and so, we have that pilot underway, stay tuned, and we should have some more data on that soon. Um, and with that, I thank you for your time and I welcome your questions. Thank you so much for that. I think we have time for one question um, from one of our attendees is, what resources are available post-transplant to families who are facing financial obstacles? Um, that is a really good question, and it's probably, um, you know, state and, and local, um, local geographic area dependent. Um, you know, when we've talked to, to patients and families and, um, you know, I think a lot of families turn to GoFundMe and things like that, you know, CODA, I think there was a talk by CODA here, but CODA seems like an amazing resource for families. Um, but I, I do think, you know, one of the things that we're hoping the patient navigator health advocate can help, help with is to identify which local resources are available. So are there food pantries or um, legal resources for families having housing problems, um, things like that. All right, well, thank you. I'd like to thank Dr. Woodwani for his time. And if you're uh, here to stick around for the next session, which is asking if your post-transplant journey has been normal and any further questions, we will get to uh, Dr. Woodwani after, to answer after this. Thank you so much. All right, thank you, take care.